call the Ag, Rural Development and Housing Finance Committee to order here for Monday, March 4th. Um, members, uh, we'll get started with uh, Senator Nelson's right. uh, Senate, file. Senate File 1010, uh, Senator Nelson. And uh, Keith uh, Olander, uh, if you can come up as well, I understand. Uh, we'll start with your quick presentation. And um, the Senator Nelson. Okay. Senator Nelson, uh, welcome. And um, why don't you uh, just briefly tell us about your bill, and then we'll have Mr. Olander uh, present and talk about uh, members' uh, mental health and uh, many of the uh, concerns and issues we've heard about that. Uh, that's kind of the topic of today and overall uh, uh, mental health and health care. Um, we've got several bills, but many, many of them are the same or very similar. And so we're going to try to kind of group them together as a topic. And Mr. Olander's uh, presentation, I think, will apply to uh, most, of the, most of the ones dealing with mental health. Uh, but we wanted to get them all on the agenda, and some of them I think will be relevant quite quick. Uh, we also uh, have to get to, uh, and we want to get to uh, uh, the health care co-ops uh, that are an outgrowth of the legislation the Senate passed two years ago, allowing them to uh, be an option for consumers and farmers specifically, and uh, those dealing with ag business. So we want to get to that presentation and uh, find out uh, what's being done here in Minnesota for farmers with uh, 40 squared as well as land of lakes and so uh, I think that'll prove to be a very enlightening and interesting update as well for for us uh, dealing with agriculture issues. So Senator Nelson tell us about your bill and uh, Mr. Olander a welcome to our committee. Thank, th thank you um, Chair <laughs> Westrom. Uh, I would like to present Senate file 1010 to you today. Uh, Senate file 1010 um, appropriates money for mental health grants for farm families and business operators. Uh, we know that um, we have a mental health crisis in our state in general, very hard uh, to um, access in many cases and there's many barriers. And we know that right now, many of our farmers are facing increased financial stress. Uh, certainly we've had six years of low commodity prices and at the same time those input prices have been escalating. And currently right now there's only one mental health professional in the state that is dedicated to farmers uh, who is here with us today. Uh, Senate File 1010 would fund at least one additional farmer mental health professional. Uh, this uh, Senate File 1010 is for appropriations from the general fund to the Commissioner of Agriculture to transfer to the Board of Trustees for Minnesota State Colleges and Universities for additional statewide mental health counseling supports to farm families and business operators. That's it, Mr. Chair. It's very simple and straightforward. My testifiers can give you a little bit uh, better background on the rural mental health, Minnesota farm business management, and the need. Very good. Uh, thank you, Senator Nelson. Uh, Mr. Olander, uh, identify yourself for the record. I think you've uh, met several of us. Uh, and uh, tell us, just uh, identify yourself, I guess, but where, where you're from and um, talk to us about uh, farmer, uh, farm business management, uh, which is part of what you oversee and work with, uh, but also the mental health component uh, and uh, we appreciate it. Mr. Apple uh, is your other testifier, Senator Nelson? Yes, correct. And uh, we'll have uh, him come next. So, All Mr. Right. Olander, welcome to our committee. Thank you, Chair Westrom. Appreciate the opportunity, members. My name is Keith Olander. I direct AgCentric, which is a center of excellence for Minnesota State. By nature of that responsibility, I also direct or co-direct Minnesota Farm Business Management and the rural mental health work that we do within Minnesota State. I want to just share with you a brief overview of where we are in terms of the program, uh, the finances that have led us to the current situation in, in the distress and the rural mental health needs, and then finally to the program itself, uh, where we're at statistically, and of course where we can move forward uh, with opportunity. So with that being said, uh, direct uh, to the screens accordingly in front of you, just a quick map, an overview of the program. Uh, not necessarily that you need to know the colors, but that we represent across the state of Minnesota. Uh, with that, we've operated since 1951. 
Uh, we have 67 faculty that work directly with farmers in farm business management, about 2,700 of those currently enrolled in that program. It's in eight colleges. The faculty operate independently. This is not a classroom situation. This is a kitchen table situation. Each farm, we are finding the resiliency that's needed within that farm by benchmarking them and then assisting them individually to move forward. They are operated, as I mentioned earlier, myself and Brad Slesher, the two directors of the Centers of Excellence within Minnesota State that operate this program and bringing us to rural mental health, of course, along with that. Minnesota Farm Business Management, the outcomes or benefits of that program, predominantly in benchmarking or peer operations, in other words, within each enterprise, growing where they're at. You hear a lot on the radio advertisements I did on the way down today, cost of production, cost of production. Where is that at? And that leads to the marketing plan. And so benchmarking is a key component to that. Rec Records. Managing what you measure is another key component. Every farm operation, every business needs good, accurate records. Finally, there's opportunities within guidance in loans, guidance in just general operations, uh, finding farm resiliency, offer, oftentimes in a team approach situation. There is the farm business management instructor obviously leading that with the farm operators, owners, but as well as other key individuals to that farm operation. In today's agriculture, farms, of course, uh, a lot of dollars and a lot of decisions, and they have a team that uh, they surround themselves with. And ultimately, we talk about resiliency, and we're going to focus on farm resiliency, but more in that operator and, and mental health resiliency as we go forward. So how do we get here? Well, 2018, and some of the statistics uh, <laughs> members you have seen before, I'm just bringing this back up to uh, in front of you so that we can set the context for the conversation. The 2018 was a very challenging year. This is now going to be the sixth year. Uh, I'm going to show you that statistically as we move forward. Planting, growing, season, harvest, and now winter. As we know, we lost 20 dairy barns across the state here just in the last week or two. Just again, adding that level of stress. A lot of variance across the state. I'm going to demonstrate that as well. And with the new farm bill that was just passed in December, brings another set of changes. And anytime things change, we know that brings another level of stress to the situation, particularly within the operations that are out there in greater Minnesota. <clears throat> Excuse me. So let's take a look at state farm finances. And we don't need to spend a lot of time on this. I really want you to pay attention to the right side and look at 2013 through 2017. Look at the big picture, how those are in terms of the comparison of history. And here's where I want you to come from the context. Assume we started farming in 2001 and 2002. We had a decade of a ramp up of farm net income that was growing set a great context and expectation. And we are now entering into a multiple years, six years of flat to low net farm income. Keeping in mind that when we look at, in this case, $28,620, we have to take family living and debt service out of that additionally. That gets very, very tight in these operations. If we look forward to rate of return reflects the same thing. Again, I want you to just look at 2013 and beyond. Very flat. And this multiple years of flat income leads to a pressure cooker situation. If we were to take 2009 in that one instance, most farmers have a resiliency to come through that very well. But in this case, when we have multiple years, I'm trying to get us to understand why we are at the stress levels we are on the farms. This is family living. And I want you to keep in mind this number because we're going to compare it to the next slide. Family living last year in 2017, and we're just compiling the 2018 numbers, but in 2017, we were just shy of $60,000. And I think many of you are fully aware that about 50, 40 to 50% of that goes for health care in terms of the numbers that we spend on the farm. And so when we look at that and we go back to one of the previous slides where I've got $29,000 of net farm income, you understand the money management on farms nowadays is more critical than ever and thus leading to a tremendous amount of stress. If we look at it from across the regions of the state, you'll see that the Northwest fares the best, the Northeast fares the worst, and the rest of them fall in between, and you'll get those averages out of there. But it does show regionally that if we look at that to family living and debt service, it makes it almost an impossible situation. So resiliency on the farm right now is really critical and a super big challenge to overcome, especially as we're building cash flows right now for the 2019 crop year. So let's look at this from a U.S. perspective, just to put context around Minnesota. This is a little bit harder to read, I apologize, but if you look at the states very quickly, obviously all but two, so 46 of the 48 contiguous states, when you look at 2013 to 2017, the net farm incomes are significantly down. Minnesota actually is third worst, not that we want to carry that as an award, but that is the fact of the matter. Uh, so as NAS reports, we've had a 76 
percent reduction in income, net farm income. And oftentimes when we look at this, and especially we want to look at those, if you had a net farm income or you compare it to a job situation, if your income were to decrease by 76 percent, while costs and input remain increase or the same, you understand the situation our farmers are in. Again, if we look at this, and I've heard this often, let's compare it to the 80s. If we look at the actual real estate debt is now greater than it was in the 80s. Now, I don't want to sound the wrong, the wrong alarm. It's not that we're in a situation where things are worse nationally in terms of where the debt is staggered. We have a different situation within our credit system. However, the amount of debt is increased as you look at that from 1970 forward. Again, just context around what our day, daily life is for our farmers. The headlines, of course, read this. One of the things that we are not proud of, but that we see this happens to be CBS News back in June. Uh, the rates of suicide are now surpassing veterans. Um, it's just staggering that that, we use that sometimes as a beacon, but unfortunately that's where the media picks up as the worst case scenario. And not that that's happening everywhere, but we do know that that pace is increasing. And this article, of course, uh, le it lends itself to that. This particular article goes at a di different context. This is New York Times. I just picked a couple of headlines. But I want you to look at when the death of a family farm leads to a suicide. Oftentimes, what I hear sometimes, when we have a situation where economics are poor, well, it's like, well, let's get a different job, right? But in farming, as you know, it's a legacy that they're building, often multi-generational farms. So when the farm is lost, it's a legacy lost. That is a crippling effect on the mind of a lot of farmers if they're in that situation. And we are experiencing that through bankruptcies, mediations, liquidations. Current staff for rural mental health. As you know, I think you've met Ted Matthews. He supports the partnership with the Department of Agriculture and the Ag Centers of Excellence. There's his contact information. But just one thing I want to point out. As we look at his last year fiscal year report, which Brad and I get, he logged nearly 3,000 hours of work and this does not include the public presentations. That's not something as employers we would be proud of to say about an employee, although we know he's very dedicated. But the fact of the matter is, if we look at that, this alone is a 1.5 FTE. Furthermore, if we look at the issues around what Ted deals with and what is in specific within rural mental health, there's frustration with agencies, bureaucratic hassles. Partner and labor relations continue to grow on the farms as they grow larger with employees. Communication between family members, business partners. As, you can, as I just pointed out, the financial situations get distressful. Do, so do all the communications on there. There's a changing role for women in today's agriculture and on the farm and adding a new complexity. There's feelings of dread and hopelessness. If thinking about six years of what I just outlined in terms of the economic finances and how, what the thought process is. And at this point, 2019 is not appearing to be any better for us. The stress, anxiety, and depression. Domestic abuse, and again, these are just topics that Ted provides to us in terms of what's going on, and our farm business management faculty uh, refer to as well. And then, of course, there's stress in seeking financial assistance. Oftentimes we think about, well, let's go get a new lender or another line of credit, and that isn't always an option. Family relationships are stressed. Marriages are stressed. Stresses occur between siblings and between uh, children and parents. Obviously, current concerns about the weather. Who would have thought that now on top of last year that we would be dealing with situations where we have the dairy situation compounded by the fact we're losing the roofs on the barns, particularly in the southeast? Uncertainty over markets. And certainly, I don't have to go down that road very far to understand where we're at when we start looking at th uh, places like China and what's occurring or not occurring there in terms of markets. And then working with other farmers in profitability. And we've looked at how solitary farmers are, but how do we form uh, cooperatives within themselves to work across there and do that in a profitable manner that's equitable. And then there's this fear of losing the farm. Farmers oftentimes, if I spend time with myself with kitchen tables, one of their greatest fears is what do I do if I don't do this? So let's look at some key takeaways. First of all, it's very important that we understand that Rural Mental Health Program in Minnesota has some very good partners. It is successful because of our farm business management faculty who engage regularly with these farmers, refer those farmers. It's imperative that we have a funding vessel that you send through Minnesota Department of Agriculture and their support to what this program is. And of course, the centers of excellence that Brad and I are able to coordinate the program and make it happen. And obviously, it's key that we on top that Ted or people like Ted are there to do that. And I hope that I've demonstrated some of the demand for that. 
Ted needs to be on call 24 seven. It would be nice if we had additional bodies so we could take some of that load off. Travel to the kitchen table is one of the biggest keys that we need to understand. This program does not occur in an office in St. Paul, nor does it occur in an office in Hutchinson where Ted lives. We do have college offices that Ted uses, but by and large, this occurs at the family farm. If we were to move to a situation where we told farmers, we've got help for you, but you need to drive 60, 80, 90 miles to get it, it won't happen, and the program is gonna fail. Referrals from the FBM faculty are key. Ted works very closely with our FBM faculty, both in conferences and presenting. Sometimes he's working with them personally because they as well are working daily with farmers who are in constant distress. But at the same time, their ability to send families forward for Ted to give them for needed help is critical. And that's something that I hope that the committee members would understand today. And the other side is that it operates on the, on the road. And I've already alluded to that it's limited office time. And that makes a unique individual and a unique program. So I appreciate the support that could be sent this way to do this. Our FBM faculty already operate in this manner, which they are operating out with farm families. So just to recap, we have one psychologist right now. We've got 2,700 students. We know statistically that we touch another 4,000 farmers through our public presentations. So right now, Ted is expected to serve those 6,700. And if I encompass all of Minnesota, we've got somewhere about 80,000 farms, depending upon how you want to define them. The ratio doesn't look so good. So that's one area where I would ask the committee to step forward to offer additional support, and I appreciate the bills that are being offered to do so. With that, I'd open it up to any questions, and hopefully I've given you an overview of why we are where we're at with the farm finances, what some of the program is, and where we potentially could go in the future to strengthen this to support our farm families, which so direly need it right now in Minnesota. Thank you, Mr. Olander. Uh, a very, very good recap, and we appreciate, appreciate that. Um, why don't we have Mr. Apple uh, come, and then uh, members, if you have questions of either uh, we can we can get into questions. Mr. Apple, identify yourself for the record. Uh, welcome to our committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Appreciate the opportunity to appear before you today. <clears throat> My name is Tom Apple. I'm currently the executive director of the Minnesota Association of Agricultural Educators. That group is composed of high school instructors, post-secondary instructors, farm business management instructors, and university personnel. Uh, today I want to speak to the 67 farm business management instructors uh, who I somewhat represent uh, as the executive director. Uh, when I visit with those folks on an annual basis, many times a year, we, we talk about where are we at and whatever our problems. Uh, certainly the rural mental health issue is out there. Uh, Mr. Olander, I think, has done an exceptional job uh, in really painting the picture with a lot of accuracy in terms of where we're really at. If you asked any of those instructors how important that this would be, I'm confident they would use the words critical, absolutely must, uh, et cetera. So it, it's something that we really do need to look at. Uh, I had a lot of other things I was going to say, but I, I don't want to be redundant and, and repeat Keith. Uh, I think he's done an exceptional job. In the end, the priorities that, that we as an association and our FBM instructors see, we need to have this program. We need some transition for our current position. Uh, Ted's done a fantastic job, but eventually he's going to want to move on down the line. Uh, in terms of number of positions, uh, Keith already alluded to the sign of the windshield time and the fact that this is an on the, at the kitchen table type of a program. So we really need to, to try to find the funds to fund two positions for a rural mental health center uh, specialist from our centers. I don't think the other concern that I was going to bring up is going to be a problem, but oftentimes, sometimes when we pass new legislation, we have difficulty in getting those funds to flow out to where they need to, but hopefully if we follow the same format under TEDS, we'll have that to go. So I uh, speak very, very, very favorably of, of adding a couple positions for our rural mental health. Thank you, Mr. Apple. Uh, members, questions? Mr. Olander, um, why don't you uh, just talk about uh, Mr. Mr. Matthews and um, kind of some of the things we've talked about. I understand uh, he's nearing retirement uh, with an idea of uh, transitioning to one or potentially two 
replacements. Uh, just touch briefly on that, uh, as I, I know it'll apply to some of the other bills coming up as well um, okay. while you're here. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members, I appreciate the opportunity. So Mr. Matthews made it, I think, fairly public. Uh, it's certainly straightforward to Brad and I. He is 71 years old. He does not intend to do this much longer. Um, obviously, we know that we had some of this coming through last session, and that didn't work so well. I think if we had some sort of a situation where that occurred again, I think Ted would probably leave us prematurely. Ted has agreed at this point that he would stay with us for about 24 months in a mentorship situation. Um, we have had interest from individuals that could come in to do Ted's work. Obviously, we go through a hiring process. Um, that being said, it's critical that we look at some sort of mentorship. Uh, historically, this occurred in the 80s. We had, at that time, we had four real mental health specialists when we came through. What I'll allude to, it was a crisis at that time. Um, in this case, it would be ideal if we would be able to place a position or somebody at each of the centers and use Ted's professional knowledge, wisdom, experiences to mentor them in a situation for 24 months. And then at the end of 24 months, obviously, we would hope to have two new folks that could carry this further beyond that. Mr. Westrom, am I answering your question? Yes, you, you are, Mr. Olander. Um, and I think um, as we move through this, uh, uh, any, any questions specific to this? Otherwise, members will move to Senator Sparks' bill. Let him present. Mr. Olander, if it works for you, maybe I'd just have you stay there. And uh, I think you're our go-to testifier for okay. several of these, these uh, bills, if that would work. I'd be happy to. So with uh, Mr. Senator, Chair, Senator just... Nelson, uh, concluding comments or Thank question? You. Yes, yes. Thank yeah. you, Mr. Chair. And I want to thank you for the time that you have uh, invested in this uh, critically important issue. Uh, my hope is that we will see, um, see this need funded. Um, I think it's important to maximize the resources that we already have, uh, which would be to um, certainly uh, finance uh, the ability to have a mental health professional for each of the uh, agricultural uh, centers of excellence, and then it's a wonderful thing to be able to start with the expertise that Mr. Matthews already has. And so it would be a shame uh, if we lost what he what has already been done. And so my hope is this committee would find the ability to um, fund Senate File 1010 uh, to that to that level. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Very very good, uh, Senator Nelson. Thank you for bringing it forward and uh, uh, presenting it. And members uh, at this point. Uh, Given that, we will uh, lay it over for possible inclusion in a future omnibus finance bill. Thanks, uh, Senator Nelson. Senator Sparks, uh, Senate File 553. Uh, Senator Sparks, uh, Senator Sparks uh, moves Senate File 553 for possible inclusion in a future omnibus bill. Um, Mr. Chair, if, if it's okay with you, too, um, I do have an author's amendment, the A1 amendment, that would put the let, bill in the shape that... Uh, let's, uh, let's do that right away. Senator Sparks, just anything significant in the A1 amendment? Otherwise, we'll get it in the shape the author wants. Uh, I think it just kind of moves to match what has uh, previously happened in the House, Mr. Chair. Okay. So, uh, members, and all Mr. those... Mr. Knopf could help a little bit more, but I believe that's what the intent Mr. of the amendment was. Mr. Knopf, anything major change or what what is it intending to do uh, mr. chair and members this this amendment does put it in the shape that the house currently has the companion bill for it of senator sparks okay and I think it's on the floor in the house for so uh, to get it in the shape the author would care for uh, members uh, all those in favor of the a1 amendment say aye. aye opposed same sign motion prevails so uh, senator sparks to your bill as amended uh, why don't you go ahead? Okay, do you, thank you. Do you have very any much. other testifiers, uh, Senator Sparks? Um, AJ Dewar is here up to help me answer questions if you have any. I think that okay. Mr. Uh, Olander did a really nice job of laying out the importance of why we're all here today. So, so Mr. Yeah, Chair, I appreciate you uh, giving me an opportunity to speak a little bit to Senate File 553. I think that we all understand the importance of uh, mental health for our farmers uh, statewide. Uh, each bill that we're going to hear today, uh, Senator Nelson obviously had a, a good bill. Uh, myself, I know that you have a, a 
bill, Mr. Chairman, as well as Senator Dreheim and Senator Dame. So I think the, ultimately we all understand that this is an issue that we really need to move forward with, and I'm confident that uh, working together we'll be able to do that. Um, with that, Mr. Chair, I know we have a long list. I think maybe I'll just turn it over to Mr. Dewar to explain a little bit what we're trying to do with Senate File 553. Very good. Uh, Mr. Dewar, welcome uh, to the committee. Identify yourself for the record, and go, you may go, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and, and members of the committee. Uh, for the record, my name is uh, Andrew Dewar, uh, also here representing the Minnesota Association of Agricultural Educators. And uh, yeah, I, I can go through the, uh, as Mr. Knopf said, this is the, you know, um, this is similar to what the, the House did. And um, it, it, it uh, uses funding from the current budget year. It cancels out um, some funding from the agri funds. And I, I believe that, um, uh, the Department of Agriculture is is okay with that, uh, not to speak for them, uh, but um, and and in uh, in section two it starts off with the uh, you know, it it raises the the amount of uh, funds that go to Mr. Matthews by fifteen thousand uh, dollars. Again, uh, my understanding is that it's a kind of a bridge to the next budget. Um, it also funds in. Um, in uh, subsection two there, $40,000 for an additional person to work with uh, Mr. Matthews. Again, that's, that's uh, thought of as a bridge to the next budget beginning on July 1st. And, um, and to the other section of the bill, I, I can't speak too intelligently to, but looking at it, it looks like it's $30,000 to the uh, Department of Agriculture for the, for the work that they do at the department and $15,000 uh, for uh, farm advocates and, and farmer lender mediators. And, and uh, uh, my understanding is uh, this bill is, it's a one-time appropriation out of the current budget cycle, and it essentially serves as a, a bridge to the, the, the next budget. Very good. Uh, members, any questions? And uh, if no questions, uh, Senator Sparks, uh, thank you for presenting uh, my bill. Uh, which will be coming up next is quite similar, so we'll uh, just go through these bills uh, real, real quickly, members. Um, with that, uh, the bill is laid over for possible inclusion. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Members. Thank you, Senator Sparks. Go Dreheim first. Okay. Senator Dreheim, we're going to call you up next, actually. Thank you, Chair. I'm already... And do you have an A1 amendment? I do have A1. Uh, briefly tell us what that does, and we'll move it to get it in the shape the author wants. Pretty much that's very similar to what uh, uh, Senator Sparks does, just gets it in shape. Okay. Uh, all those in favor of the A1 amendment say aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. Motion prevails. <coughs> to the bill as amendment, amended, Senator Dreheim, uh, uh, what does this say? Senate file, Senator Dreheim moves Senate file 251 be recommended to pass and move to the Finance Committee. Uh, Senator Dreheim. Thank you, uh, Chair. And I'd like to start out by thanking my co-authors, Senator Lang, Senator Johnson, Senator Goggin, and uh, Senator Dames. So thank you. You know, this is pretty much the same thing we've heard earlier today, and it's my uh, second mental health bill of the day today, so I appreciate the chairs hearing them. We, we all know that there's a problem out there. Uh, with mental health, and I think everybody has a, a, a friend or a family member that has struggled, and with the challenging times in the agriculture community, I, I think uh, it's it's pretty obvious we need to do more, and this is my attempt to do more. And with that, I'll I'll appreciate your time. Thank you, uh, members. Any questions? Technical. Uh, there's another technical amendment. Uh, the chair will move, Senator. Or Senator Dreheim, but uh, Mr. Knopf, could you just identify uh, the technical amendment for yeah, the committee? Mr. Chairman, in section one, the number is missing. Um, and so on line 1.6 before is insert $70,000. So we're canceling $70,000 to match with the appropriation in the next section. And it's just got dropped. Um, my fault, probably. Okay. So. Um, so that oral amendment, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion prevails. <coughs> to the bill as amended, uh, any discussion? Having none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion prevails. 
I think you're on your way to finance, Senator Dryham. We're trying to get here. Give this to <laughs> Mark. No. Next up is Senate File 1726. Senator Westrom moves Senate File 1726 to be recommended to pass and be referred to the Committee on Finance. Senator Westrom, we have Senate File 1726 before us. To your uh, bill. Mr. Mr. Chair and committee members, uh, similar topic, same topic, I should say. And uh, this, again, would uh, be similar to uh, Senator Sparks' bill uh, with additional authors. Uh, there's been great support bipartisanly for uh, the topic of mental health and the concern that uh, those involved in agriculture are going through. And so uh, this bill would deal with uh, an expenditure for this year, yet during the fiscal year, um, if we were to uh, get able, able to be passed and uh, help uh, use some monies from, from this fiscal year towards the mental health efforts that we've been hearing about with the prior bills. And so. Uh, with that, I'd urge your support, and uh, we'd be on our way to finance as well. Thank you, Mr. We uh, Senator Westrom. I see you have a testifier on the list. Would uh, Ms. Linetti like to speak? Thanks, Mr. Chair. Members of the committee, for the record, my name is Josie Linetti, Associate Director of Public Policy with the Minnesota Farm Bureau. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to provide some short remarks this afternoon. Um, we're appreciative of this legislation being brought forward and for the committee taking ample time for discussions on mental health. Um, we can change how we accept and respond to mental health conversations now and in the future with additional resources, tools, and support systems for members of the agriculture community. Um, Thank you again for taking the time to hear this, and I just wanted to generally be up here and be supportive. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Sir Westrom, any final comments? Uh, no, Mr. Chair, uh, just we do appreciate the farm groups and uh, uh, what they do to help get the message out. Uh, they and bankers and uh, those involved with uh, those farmers and those in agriculture, uh, they sometimes are at the front lines and they uh, have the intimate and close relationships with farmers and friends to uh, help spread the word and uh, make sure uh, they can offer help and assistance and that's part of what we're doing here with the mental health funding to uh, make sure that backbone continues to be in place. Well, thank you, Senator Westrom. Senator Westrom renews his motion that Senate File 1726 be recommended to pass and re referred to the Committee on Finance. All those in favor? Aye. All those opposed? The motion prevails. Thanks, Senate File 1726 is referred. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Thanks, Keith. Thanks, Keith. Well, the chairman is getting up to his gavel again. We'll have Senate File 1722. Senator Dames. So Senator Lang moves Senate File 1722 to be laid over for possible inclusion in an omnibus bill. Senator Dames, we have Senate File 1722 before us. To your uh, thank bill. You. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, thank you for, in, for allowing me to introduce Senate File number 1722. Senate File 1722 is uh, requesting some funding for the uh, additional uh, uh, folks to work with mental health and counseling for their farm families. And this would be going to the Board of Trustees of the uh, Minnesota State Colleges, and it would be handled through the South Central College and the Central Lakes Colleges, our centers of agriculture in the northern and southern part of the state. I do have a testifier here, so I would like to turn it over to Mr. Olander, the Dean of the North Central Agricultural Excellence Program. 
Very good. Mr. Olander, to uh, Senator Dames's bill. Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members, I appreciate the opportunity once again. Uh, just looking at you know, going forward and expanding the opportunities that we have in rural mental health and the capacity is our big issue with that. I think I've already shared the reasons why we need this additional capacity and we appreciate the work of Senator Dames to bring this bill forward. Thank you, uh, Mr. Olander. Uh, members' questions? Senator Dames, uh, we thank you for bringing the bill forward uh, as a part of the discussion and uh, efforts uh, on agriculture mental health. Um, with no further questions, uh, the chair will live, lay, lay the bill over for possible inclusion in the omnibus finance bill. Thank you, Senator Dames. Uh, thank you have you, one Mr. more chair bill. And members. Two more. Two more bills. Senate file. What's the next? Senator, uh, the chair moves Senate file 17. 1723 to be laid over for possible inclusion in an omnibus finance bill. Senator Dames, to your bill. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senate, Senate File 1723 is also a bill on mental health uh, in agriculture. And to support that, we do have uh, one individual now that does a lot of the mental health stuff for agriculture. And with the state of the economy, it is... Uh, to the point where we need to be looking seriously at to putting some more money into mental health uh, in rural Minnesota for the folks that, uh, in the agricultural industry. And this bill requests 330000 in fist for each fiscal year, and that money again would be sent to the Board of Trustees of the state colleges and handled by South Central and Central Lakes, the agricultural centers of excellence in North and South. And so uh, comparable to the last bill, just more money. And uh, also I'd like to have uh, Mr. Olander speak on that. Mr. Olander, uh, to, to uh, the bill, uh, uh, go ahead. Identify hey. yourself again for the record. Uh, Keith Olander, Director of Ag Centric and working with Minnesota Farm Business Management and the Rural Mental Health Program here in Minnesota. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members. Uh, the other question we probably should talk about a little bit is the idea of what happens after the economic crisis is gone. I got that question. Um, one thing we need to keep in mind, our farm situation right now, the USDA projects we're going to have about 9 million farm transitions occur in the next decade. Now, not obviously all those in Minnesota but there's going to be a fair percentages of that. A lot of Ted's work that goes on now within farm family communications is between the parents and the children or whoever the heirs are going to be or the transferee of the farm. And so even beyond the economic situation that we run into, the communications aspect of this is going to become more dynamic as we go further into the future. As our farms tend to grow larger as we go forward and the dollars grow larger, that also puts more pressure on the communications. So I want to encourage us to think about longer term that we're going to need this for additional pieces in that farm transition piece. The other thing is, let's not kid ourselves, our economy is cyclical. So just because we may rise out of this at some point, we know that we go through ups and downs. And we will be much more stable if we can have a couple of bodies in this position offering the capacity beyond what we are currently able to do with one. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Very, very good. Mr. Olander, Senator Dames. Uh, Mr. Chair and members, I'd just like to, it appears that we had, uh, you, that you've heard approximately seven bills on mental health, and I find it interesting that they're coming from all corners of the state. So it really says we do have an issue, and it's not just in one pocket, it's, it's throughout the state of Minnesota. And I think it's something that uh, we certainly need to move on. And whether it's my bill or somebody else's bill, that's not my concern. My concern is that hopefully we can do something because it is an issue. And if we don't do something this year, next year, the issue is going to compound. And there could be a lot of side issues that come from not dealing with it. So first of all, Mr. Chair, I'd like to thank you and your committee members for listening to these bills. I know it would be easy just to take one bill. But I'm glad that you listened to them all because it's a little different story from every part of the state. So with that said, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, th thank you, Senator Dames. And thanks also for bringing it forward uh, to uh, help bring the attention to this issue with uh, different ideas of, of funding and uh, how we move forward. So uh, very helpful. Members, uh, any questions, comments? Otherwise, uh, the chair will lay the bill over for possible inclusion. Thank you, Senator Dames. One uh, last bill, Senate file 
708, uh, the chair moves Senate file 708 for possible inclusion in a future omnibus bill. Senator Dames to that bill. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. And uh, shifting gears a little bit here, Senate file 708 is a bill requesting money for the Minnesota Agricultural Education Leadership Council. And this council is very instrumental working with the, the agricultural and FFA throughout the state of Minnesota. Plus, they do a lot of other things with the ag programs. And so uh, we haven't received additional money for several years. And so that's the purpose of this bill. And I'd like to ter turn it over to testifier Sarah Dornick uh, to outline probably what some of this money will be used for. Ms. Dornick, uh, welcome to our committee. Uh, identify yourself for the record, and uh, you may proceed. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Westrom, members of the committee. My name is Sarah Dornick. I'm the Executive Director of the Minnesota Agricultural Education Leadership Council, or MILSI. Just a quick refresher, MILSI is a 17-member legislative council that works to promote and expand ag ed opportunities across the state. We're a very small staff. It's myself as the director and Carrie Schwab serves as a program coordinator. We're housed out of the University of Minnesota St. Paul campus, and they serve as our fiscal agent. 8% of our budget is used for administrative costs. The other 92% goes out back across across the state for both schools, organizations, and individuals through our grants and scholarship programs. We work in ag literacy, school-based ag education, post-secondary education, teacher preparation, and with the farm business management program. Today we're asking for the committee support of SS708, which would be funding an increase for one specific portion of our budget that funds our grants and special projects. Currently this budget is for $235,000 and we're asking for a $265,000 increase for a total of $500,000. The original appropriation was in 2007 for $250,000. It was cut slightly in 2011 when there were some across the board cuts. This request is to keep up with inflation and demand for agriculture education um, for the past 12 years. Milsey would like to focus these additional funds in two areas. One is in our, in our grants program funding and to support initiatives to assist in the recruitment and the retention of students, teachers, and programs. Each year there are excellent ag education programs that we're unable to support. In the last five years, we've awarded grants at a 54.5% rate. However, we have been unable to fund $300,000 in grant requests each year. A few examples from recent rounds that we have not been able to fund include a um, teacher professional development uh, at Farm America in Wasika, a tractor safety education curriculum with the University of Minnesota Extension, and a leadership program for the Minnesota FFA alumni. It also means we cannot fund local pro projects such as a program expansion at the Academy for Science and Agriculture in Badness Heights, classroom equipment and new courses for places in like Canby, Howard Lake, Tracy, Osakis, Ogilvy, and many others, and urban agriculture literacy projects such as those at the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum, the Woodbury YMCA, and Metro State. Each time we're not able to fund a grant, these are opportunities missed for providing access and experiences for students. These are lost chances to engage our youth in agriculture and food systems and untapped employees for our agriculture, food, and natural resources workforce. The other portion of these funds we use to implement strategies around recruitment and retention of students, teachers, and programs. These initiatives include an internship, a Teach Ag Ambassador program, communications, and a statewide curriculum project. Because of our role as a collaborative hub and a spark for innovation, we have become an established partner and leader beyond acting as a steward of resources. However, the way our funding is designated, we do not have the ability to manage the initiatives we are often asked to lead. The funding increase will not only allow us to fund grants or startup initiatives, it will support what our partners have been asking us to do. The opportunity to strategically take on projects as MILSI initiatives that exist separately from one-time grant applications. Thank you for your time today and consideration to further support MILSI. I'd be happy to answer any questions about MILSI or the bill. And Chairman Members, Western, any questions? Senator Dames? We do have one other testifier. Mr. Orlander would like to testify also in this bill. Okay, very good. Mr. Orlander, to the bill, just identify yourself uh, for the record and uh, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Keith Orlander, Director of AgCentric, Minnesota Farm Business Management. One very specific example I'll give you about MILC is back in the wave of $7 corn in 2012 and 13. Farm Business Management at that time was seen by some as maybe not needed. And so the program was a fledgling program at best within Minnesota State. MILC was critical in its resilience in that program to bring some funding about with your support to Minnesota Farm Business Management and the eight colleges we work with. 
I dare say I would be scared to say what the program would look like without what Mielsi has done in the work of that over the past handful of years, and specifically with Ms. Dornick as the leadership there. That being said, Think of where we would be today if Farm Business Management wasn't as strong as it is. So I really would be, I'm one here that has experienced being a Farm Business Management faculty uh, at that time and now coming into administrative leadership and working alongside of what MealC does. So I strongly encourage you to consider this funding going forward to support MealC. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Rolander. Uh, members, any questions or comments? Senator Weber. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I just want to go back to an earlier comment that Mr. Olander had made about the future transitioning that's going to be happening, and indeed that's going to require in many instances, I think, uh, additional farm management skills and courses uh, for uh, these upcoming generations as they, uh, number one, figure out a way uh, in order to accomplish that transition from grandpa and grandma or from mom and dad. And, uh, and I think uh, it points to a, a greater and larger need in the upcoming years uh, for this program as well. Very good. Thank you, Senator Weber. Any other comments or questions, members? Having none, uh, um, Senator Dames, uh, thank you for bringing this bill forward. Uh, the chair will lay it over for possible inclusion in the omnibus finance bill. Uh, Ms. Dornick, thanks for your testimony, Mr. Olander, uh, both to this and uh, the mental health and the farm business advocate um, picture that uh, you well painted for us as uh, we contemplate how to best proceed and, and move forward with this uh, very important issue. So, uh, Senator Dames, uh, thank you again. And yeah, uh, thank you, members. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and members. Uh, we do appreciate the opportunity. Thanks for bringing them forward. So members, uh, we'll move into the uh, unique uh, health care option uh, Minnesota has uh, uh, been developing over the last two years. And uh, the legislature, uh, if, if those of you involved with the health care net networks or co-ops want to come forward uh, while I introduce uh, the topic a little further, um, that'd be great. But uh, members, uh, I thought this would be very uh, revealing and helpful to understand for your constituents, our constituents, uh, for ag groups, farmers, and um, what two years ago uh, we found ourselves in a uh, tough health care crisis. We still continue to see issues and problems with it, but there's uh, also some promise and uh, new things that have developed in the market uh, because of what we passed two years ago. Uh, last year, uh, if you, or two years ago, if you recall, and the testifiers will talk about it further, I believe, but uh, in the health care reform and uh, preservation act uh, that was passed, uh, preservation attempts, one of the things was to allow co-ops relating to agriculture to uh, get into the health care market and offer a health care insurance product to farmers or those involved in ag business. And so... Uh, uh, meeting with uh, the folks from Land Lakes and 40 Squared, I've seen uh, some of the notices in our communities that they've come across the entire state. Many of you probably have as well. And I think I thought it was uh, very insightful and uh, helpful for us to know as we continue to try to uh, work with ideas to help farmers and uh, other constituent groups out with more choice and options in health care. And so um, I uh, sat with uh, Land Lakes at the chamber banquet. Um, this past uh, winter and we had an extensive discussion on it and uh, they've met uh, since and uh, we we wanted to uh, give everybody time to uh, dig a little more into this so with no further ado uh, uh, mr patrick murray i understand you would introduce uh, those that have come to talk about it uh, and uh, both uh, for 40 squared and land of lakes why don't you proceed and identify yourself for the record and tell us uh, tell us what would be helpful to know Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, my name is Patrick Murray. I'm the uh, Senior Government Affairs Director for Cooperative Network. We are a two-state trade association of about 250 cooperatives located in Minnesota as well as Wisconsin. We cover the A to Z of co-ops. Um, this includes the farm supply, dairy, electric, financial, housing, farm credit, food, worker-owned, and healthcare co-ops, which are located throughout both states. 
Again, we'd like to thank you, Chair Westrom, for allowing committee time for members here to hear updates from two former-led healthcare co-ops that were created as a result of the bill that was passed in 2017 that you had mentioned, Senator. Um, at that time, there was a concerted effort by the Republican-led legislature and then Governor Dayton to pass a suite of health care reform measures to deal with skyrocketing health care premiums and a lack of affordable coverage for those in the individual market. Thanks to lawmakers from both sides of the aisle, the legislation um, was passed to allow for the establishment of these health care cooperatives for farmers and producers. It became a reality, and as a result of that um, language that was included uh, in Senate File 1, which was uh, authored by Senator Michelle Benson. So again, thanks to all of you who were here at that time that helped and passed that bill. We do appreciate it. Um, and as a result of this bipartisan legislation, the two health care co-ops that are now available uh, as options are there to provide health insurance to a segment of the state has traditionally struggled to find affordable health care. That's Minnesota's, Minnesota's agricultural community. So with me today are two representatives from um, two of the health care cooperatives that were a result of that bill being passed in 2017. The first to my right is Shar Breeze. She's the executive director of 40 Square Healthcare Cooperative Solutions. And also to my left is Emily Maher. Emily is the director of benefits for Land O'Lakes, which as some folks may know is one of the largest cooperatives in the country um, with the headquarters located nearby in Arden Hills. So um, with that all being said, again, thank you, Chair Westrom, for having us here. Um, and I will let Shar and Emily take it from here. So thank you. Very good. Uh, thank you, Mr. Murray. And uh, Shar, who wants to go first? Sure, this is Char. I can go first. Char, if you want to identify yourself for the record, uh, sure. uh, go ahead. Yes, Mr. Chair, thank you. My name is Char Vries. I am the Executive Director of 40 Square Cooperative Solutions. And we are um, an agricultural health care co-op that was, as Patrick noted, that was created as a result of the legislation that was in Senate File 1. Um, and I just want to thank you, Mr. Chair, for having us here today, but also for those, as Patrick said, who were um, here when that passed. Um, on the committee, it didn't come through ag the Agricultural Committee, actually it went through Senator Dame's committee, um, but that were very helpful from the Ag Committee and making sure that it made it on the final bill. It's greatly appreciated. I've seen many of you at our community meetings uh, across the state that we've had last year and this year, or this, our first year and then this past year, so I just want to thank you for that as well. So. 40 Square Cooperative Solutions uh, is an independent, standalone cooperative. So you don't need to be a member of any other cooperative. You just need to meet the criteria that was laid out in statute to be um, a member of 40 Square. So you must be actively involved in production ag. Um, you must file a Schedule F or Form 1065 or be an agribusiness, um, a business that is in direct support of production agriculture. So um, with that, we are in our second plan year, as is Lando Lakes. Um, and uh, our first plan year um, was wonderful. And we have um, our board of directors, which is made up of, of nine folks, um, of, of four or five um, farmers and four investor members, all from the agricultural community. Um, <clears throat> so um, our tagline is trust, transparency, and ownership. And we take that as both staff and um, board of directors very seriously. Um, this is a cooperative that is owned um, by tho those who utilize it, and it is governed by those, um, the majority of those who utilize it as well. Um, we currently offer um, major medical plans to all across the state of Minnesota um, to any um, entity or farmer that qualifies for the plan. Um, they're not skinny down plans. Um, they're major medical plans, so they're not uh, skinny down versions. They're um, all offer are all Affordable Care Act compliant. Offer comprehensive coverage as it relates to um, doctor's office, um, ambulance, uh, emergency care, um, prescription drugs uh, coverage. Um, so they are well-rounded plans that you find in the in the um, existing individual market. Uh, with a, a very broad network, and we utilize um, the preferred one network. So if you are a preferred one, uh, if the provider is falls within the preferred one network, um, they are covered. Um, so uh, we also offer, um, as well as, is, as it relates to the health plans, we have a wonderful telemedicine offering that our members are taking advantage of, which has saved them save them thousands of dollars a year. So um, if for those common ailments, um, for you know, uh, a, 
if you have allergies or if you have strep throat, instead of um, taking time off the farm to be able to go um, for that sinus infection that you get every single year, um, you can call in to our telemedicine um, helpline and they can diagnose you uh, and, and provide a prescription and have that ready at the pharmacy with you. As a matter of fact, there was one farmer who um, just this past year had a rash, um, took a picture of it with our telemedicine offering, sent it into um, the, the telemedicine um, provider that we have, and um, had it treated and diagnosed um, in less than 15 minutes without leaving the cab of his tractor. So it's been a wonderful, wonderful offering. As well as our customer service. Our customer service, when you call 40 Square, they, a live, real person answers without having to, to push a, a bunch of buttons. Um, not only will they provide you, you know, an additional ID card, tell you where you've met your, when you've met your deductible, they actually will provide you with cost comparisons for common procedures. So if there is, if you're looking to um, get an MRI done in Mankato, you can call our customer service and find out um, if there is, within a certain radius, a uh, less costlier option. And it's not just based on cost, uh, but it's based on quality because nobody wants to get an MRI done five times um, and then having to pay more as a result. Um, we have had um, very good claim experience and our members have been very happy um, with the service that they're offering. Uh, some of the feedback is that they love that they own it. Um, they love that they can, they also like that they can offer something to their employees because we are a self-funded, um, not fully insured uh, cooperative health plan. Um, they don't have to, because we are self-funded, they don't have to meet the 50% the threshold of providing 50% of the premium. They can provide anywhere from zero to 100%, but still have something to offer their employees and their employees' families. Um, they love that they can call customer service for cost comparisons um, as well, and, um, and that they have a say in their health plans. Um, for instance, our first year, we had six um, deductible levels, and we had a lot of folks coming to us through um, our survey um, and just calling saying, can you have a higher deductible level plan? And our board of directors listened. And so and, um, for this plan year, plan year 2019, they offered a higher deductible, the highest deductible level that can be offered and still be Affordable Care Act compliant. So, um, 40 Square Cooperative Solutions was created as a result of, of the, the outcry and the need uh, for the egg of the egg community. And, um, but the reason why we didn't name ourselves 40 Square Healthcare specifically um, is because we want to be a cooperative that has the ability to be flexible. And while it may be healthcare, uh, we are looking for to meet the needs um, if needed for, for other sources of information. And it may not be just healthcare. Um, so that's why we, you know, the name was chosen 40 Square Cooperative Solutions to offer a more comprehensive and the ability to grow, um, to meet the needs of the egg community and potentially other ways as well. And so with that, um, I invite you to our annual meeting down in beautiful New Ulm that's occurring on March 21st at the Best Western there. And um, we have a, we're having a health fair, which we did last year for the first portion of our, our annual meeting, um, and then followed by the annual meeting itself. So uh, we are very, um, we pride ourselves in being very responsive to our members. Um, and this is just another way of showing how we are uh, an open and transparent cooperative um, that wants to provide quality options for Minnesota's um, agribusinesses and farmers in the community. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Very good. Uh, thank you, uh, Shar And uh, uh, Emily, uh, why don't you identify yourself uh, for the record? Uh, you're from Land O'Lakes, as I understand. Yep. And um, then members will have questions uh, of, of both of them uh, afterwards. Uh, uh, but uh, tell us about uh, Land O'Lakes and what you guys have done, uh, the need that you uh, heard out there, and uh, uh, what's resulted from the legislation we were able to pass two years ago. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Emily Maher, and I'm the Director of Benefits at Land O'Lakes. Uh, thank you very much for having us here today so that I can talk about the health options that we're offering to our members in the state of Minnesota. 
Land O'Lakes is a member-owned cooperative based in Arden Hills with operations spanning from agricultural production to consumer foods. Here in Minnesota, our membership includes nearly 380 dairy farmers, 100 local cooperatives, and 400 independent ag retail members. These are small businesses that are dotted throughout the state and that provide services to farmers. Nationwide, we have over 1,800 dairy producers and 750 ag producers with nearly 1,100 agricultural retail owners. Factoring the reach of our local co-op members, our network reaches close to 300,000 domestic producers and half of the U.S. harvested acres. We're proud to be a farmer-owned cooperative and are always looking for ways to help our members be successful, whether they're a local co-op, an ag retailer, or a family farmer. One area of particular focus for us has been health insurance. For years, we've recognized that many farmers and co-ops struggle to find comprehensive, affordable health care options, either for themselves, their families, or for their employees. Our efforts to help members access affordable and quality health care started back in 2012. That year, based on feedback from our members, we launched a fully insured health plan for certain member cooperatives to offer coverage to their co-op employees. This plan is underwritten by Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Minnesota and covers nearly 5,000 employees of those co-ops, which encompasses about 12,000 lives of rural Minnesota. In 2017, the Minnesota-specific state statute of 62H18 opened the door for expanded coverage for individual farmers. Specifically, this law allowed organizations in the agricultural industry to offer self-insured health coverage to Minnesota self-employed farmers. In response to that law, Land O'Lakes partnered with Gravy, which is a Minneapolis-based benefits marketplace, to offer health coverage through a self-insured plan for farmers of participating co-ops. We piloted the plan in 2018, and it resulted in more than 300 farmer enrollments, and it covered more than 750 lives. Participants in this plan can choose from eight insurance plans compliant with ERISA and the Affordable Care Act, all of which cover each of the 10 essential health benefits detailed in the ACA. For some of our farmers, these plans are more affordable than plans offered in the current individual market. Importantly, these plans have broad network coverage, so farmers and employees who live in rural Minnesota can obtain coverage closer to home, rather than having to drive for hours for a doctor's visit. The plan also includes some options that have fewer out-of-pocket costs. Those with pre-existing conditions are not barred from coverage under our plan and premiums are not developed based on particular participants' health conditions or based on medications they may need. Our plan also does not impose annual or lifetime limits on benefits. Adult children up to the age of 26 can participate, and the plan provides free coverage for certain preventive services. Based on the success of the plan in Minnesota, we decided to expand and offer self-insured health coverage to farmers in other states. Utilizing the association health plan regulations that were issued by the Department of Labor this past summer, we now offer health care coverage to Nebraska farmers, effective January 1, 2019. We know that our co-op members see the importance of this offering, given that so many have opted to participate and to provide their member farmers access to these benefits and our plan. For example, for the 2019 plan year, we have nearly 500 Minnesota farmers enrolled, encompassing in excess of 1,100 lives. Combined with Nebraska, our plan has grown to cover more than 2,000 lives in rural America. We hope to keep growing the plan within Minnesota, and we intend to expand the Land O'Lakes AHP into other states where our cooperative members have expressed interest, fully complying with each state law our plan, where our plan would be offered. Across Land O'Lakes, we strive every day to meet our responsibility to deliver for our member owners finding innovative and new ways to offer them health insurance coverage that meet their unique needs is just one of those ways we're doing so. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, thank you again for this opportunity to testify today, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Uh, thank, thank you uh, for, for that uh, information, and um, I'm going to start off with just, can you talk about cost? Um, has this been a savings, uh, more expensive, or just generally what, what do you find, uh, uh, and I suppose it's a little bit of a variety out there, but to both of you, if uh, you could just touch on what, uh, how, how this has helped in, in any 
aspect of uh, the cost for families uh, as an option that they might be considering against other mm -hmm. options uh, to try to provide health care for their themselves and their families. Uh, just just what, what's your experience been with, with that? Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. What we found is that those who enroll in our plan do save not only on premiums, but they also have those eight plan options from which to choose. They range in varying deductibles and out-of-pocket maximums that they can select from. Anecdotally, we've heard from farmers who have been able to save anywhere from you know, $1,000 a year to more. We've had farmers come forward who have also indicated, particularly on our dairy side, where it's been really difficult for them to find coverage because they can't find a group plan just for themselves or for their small farm. Um, they've saved you know, $500 a month for family coverage, depending on the plan, of course, that they enroll in. But overall, we found savings for all of those participants. One of the unique things with our plan is that since we partner with Gravy, which is the Minneapolis-based marketplace, when someone who's interested in enrolling calls in, the Gravy concierge service helps them uh, kind of shop for a plan, helps them identify whether or not they're subsidy eligible, and if they are subsidy eligible, helps them enroll in a plan that would be on that individual market through the state versus our plan because our interests lie in what's best for our members and so oftentimes those people end up enrolling in a plan for which they can get a subsidy. Thank you, uh, Ms. DeVries. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, similar to the Land Lakes plan, our members, again, anecdotally, we don't ask questions about what they were paying before um, compared to now, but so we have also received comments that um, they've been saving up to $500 a month uh, per month uh, for their health plans. Um, we um, at 40 Square um, also continue to look for like cost cutting and saving procedures um, such as our telemedicine offering, our customer service offering, cost comparisons as well. Um, we've recently um, partnered with another um, company called TASC, T-A-S-C, um, that allows, um, helps farmers to be able to deduct their, their um, premiums and medical expenses pre-tax um, as well. So we really look for those um, tools, not just with the, the health premium, to help lower the costs, um, particularly um, uh, for health care with, with the... Um, the egg economy, how it how it is, and how it's been going, um, but also we we too utilize. Uh, we don't use gravy, but we utilize the existing broker and agent community. So any um, broker agent um, across Minnesota can sell 40 Square, and so we too want what's best for 40 Square. We realize that we don't um, we don't promote ourselves as a as a low cost leader, but we may be you know, the best option for some folks. But we utilize and tell people that your local broker and agent is your advocate. If 40 Square is not the right choice for them, we don't want to force them into 40 Square. We want them to do what is best for them. And generally, if they receive, currently receive employer subsidized um, health care, or they are on the um, individual market and receive subsidies, that is likely their, their best cost-effective option. Um, so we really rely on the trust um, and the relationships that folks have with their local brokers and agents that they've, many of them have had for years um, to help them you know, find what is best for them. But in many cases, um, we have also, as um, Emily said, have heard anecdotal evidence of, of being much less expensive, and we are more expensive in other cases. So it, it tends to vary. Sure. So uh, I know we've talked before about this, but touch a little bit on uh, who's, your, who's your clientele. And uh, there is some limitation to agriculture or ag business, uh, but with Land O'Lakes, I understand even uh, dairy farmers that would sell milk to, to your company uh, You've, you've offered it to, to them as a customer or, or a, uh, 
a party, but but it's also the co-ops that might sell your your feed or your supplies uh, as well. But uh, talk a little bit about that, uh, if you could, uh, who who your customer is and uh, uh, what what you see in the future okay. for, for that customer base. Thank you for the question, Mr. Chair. Um, Yes, so Land O'Lakes plan is offered through our co-op members. Land O'Lakes is a member-owned cooperative. We have kind of two ways that there's ownership. So there's the co-ops themselves, and then we also have our dairy producers. And as I mentioned in my testimony, we have a plan that's offered to certain co-ops to cover their employees. However, we struggle to find a solution for our dairy farmers or even farmers who are members of our co-ops. And that's where this Minnesota-specific state statute has really helped. Uh, so those who are eligible are eligible through either their co-op, who is a member of Land O'Lakes. Those co-ops opt in to offer this as a value add to their individual farmers. Those farmers can also offer coverage to any employees that they have. They can choose to offer it to them and even provide a subsidy of employer coverage if they'd like to do that. And then we also offer it directly to our direct dairy members, dairy producers who sell us milk directly. Very good. Uh, any comment, Ms. DeVries? Yeah, so thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so for us, you, as I stated in my testimony, you don't have to be a member of any cooperative. You just have to meet the criteria that's outlined in state law and according to our, our bylaws as well to become a member of the cooperative. And there is a, um, a stock purchase um, to become a member of the cooperative, which is, is customary in cooperatives, um, of which after three years of being in the cooperative, should they choose to leave, um, according to state law, um, there is a three-year commitment um, on the individual uh, level for 40 Square. Um, they will receive that. Uh, it's an $1,100 investment. They receive that investment back upon exiting um, the cooperative. So um, we have we have um, insured elevators, employees of elevators, um, down to sole proprietors as well. So. Um, for us, the, the agribusiness aspect is, is really important. Our board, um, the, the definition that's in uh, state statute is pretty broad as it relates to who's in support, in quotation marks, in support of production agriculture. We actually get a lot of um, um, insurance agents, CPAs, that say, hey, my whole book of business are our farmers is the egg community. Can I become a member of 40 Square? I need health insurance. Well, the, the our board um, made the determination that the business must be related to um, assisting production agriculture in that 70% of the business's income has to have been derived from providing those services to those in production agriculture, and that it's agricultural related, so to speak. So because our board um, felt very strong that this is where um, our, it's, it was intended, the law was intended um, for agricultural businesses um, and for members of the ag community. And so our board at, at that time last year, uh, or two years ago, um, developed that policy. Um, to do so. Well, while uh, we're on coverage a little bit, um, I, th I think at least one of you I've talked about mental health coverage. Is there some of that as part of your offerings, or uh, we've talked about that here today with agriculture? But uh, is that is that a component of, of of any of the coverage options that consumers have? Mm -hmm. Yes, Mr. Chair, thank you for the question. Um, we do cover mental health as well as substance abuse coverage. It's one of the 10 essential benefits mm -hmm. that's required under the ACA, and that is available under all of our plans. Yes, Mr. Chair, same here. Same, okay. Members, uh, any other questions? Uh, Senator Goggin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, when I've talked to a number of my farmers in my district, they've said they don't qualify for 40 square because of a W-2 issue or they, something like that. So I, if you could enlighten us on that, I'd really appreciate it. Yeah, no, thank you. Ms. Uh, Mr. Chair, thank you. Um, 
Yes, Senator. According to the, the ERISA and the MIWA laws on the federal level, um, in order to become a member of 40 Square, they must be considered an employer. A MIWA is a multiple employer welfare arrangement, okay? So they have to show that there is a somebody, that they are an actual employer. So is somebody on the farm that they provide a W-2 to. And we have been advised by this um, from our MIWA and ERISA attorneys. And so that is, that is one of the hurdles that we do find from some folks um, because of the law uh, on the federal level, that is, that they may not qualify for 40 Square as a result. Um, in other cases, uh, a lot of folks have provided their spouse, who does the books, a W-2, um, and that has allowed them to become a member of 40 Square. But yes, it is something that we would like to, to, um, to see changed, um, but do recognize that we have to comply with the federal law in that regard. Senator Duggan, follow up? No. So, so to that, is that, does that mean, is, uh, is that driven because they might have off-farm income as a, as a second job, or, or what, what would stop that person from, from qualifying? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, it is strictly due to the fact that the, the multiple employer welfare regulations at the federal level have to prove that the individual or the business has to approve, has to ensure that they are actually an employer because it wasn't necessarily intended for um, under the law and thinking about the law when it was created. It was for multiple employers to bind together um, to purchase, to, to bind together to be able to provide health coverage. And so the, the thought, from what I understand, when the law was p passed back in the 70s on the federal level is to provide multiple employers who have employees and not just one employee, um, so, but who have small, you know, smaller employers. Um, so it is to comply with the federal, the federal regulations, Mr. Chair. Interesting. So uh, that's a federal issue that would have to be changed or... And, and, and does that mean that an individual farmer, if they don't have any employees, maybe wouldn't qualify for, for your, for, for your uh, offering, or, or am I misunderstanding that? Thank you, Mr. Chair. No, you're not misunderstanding. Okay. So uh, going forward, is there any suggestions you would have for us as uh, advocates of agriculture, uh, as, as the health care issue is, is pretty front and center in most uh, people's lives uh, that, that would be helpful for what you're doing uh, to help offer this uh, additional uh, competition, but also additional uh, consumer choice. What, what would you give us as an ag committee, uh, as, a, as a legislature, that would maybe be helpful uh, going forward as you've had a, uh, going on your second year of experience? Mr. Chair, are you, is your question related to specifically the, the statutes within and, and what created and allows us to operate, or just yeah, yeah, in general? Yeah, that or ju in general. Is there anything you, you've, you've got our ears, so uh, is there anything you'd suggest to us that we could do to help uh, more farm families, more uh, folks that uh, might, might be covered that aren't currently covered, or issues that you've run into that were either not known or unexpected or uh, that, that would be helpful. I guess that's, we, that's part of the reason we want to have this hearing is mm -hmm. uh, continue to uh, have positive uh, outcomes uh, like we've at least seen and all the consumers you've had. But I guess any, any ideas you'd have for us as, as a committee and as a legislature? Thank you, Mr. Chair. A couple of things come to mind. One, um, Increased options. Uh, as you noted, Mr. Chair, a couple of years ago, a few years ago, um, when a couple of the major fully insured carriers left the individual marketplace, it left a lot of rural areas without any options, and not just farmers, okay? Not just the egg community, but it was increasingly acute for the egg community because they are their own employers. They don't have, you know, jobs in town that they can they can go to. I mean, farming is their livelihood. They don't have a group plan to purchase into. And so I would say options, number one. Um, secondly, um, 
if you have a button that can increase, you know, the price of commodities, that would be wonderful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I, I don't mean that to be a joke necessarily, but, um, but the creative option to with what this, the legislation that passed allowed, because of what was passed in 2017, gave farmers at a minimum of two additional options potentially that they did not have before and that has created competition in the marketplace. We compete with Land O'Lakes, Land O'Lakes compete with, competes with us, but we are fortunate that we, that we work together in a, in a cooperative fashion. Um, I would say the issue, um, particularly that was on topic of today, is mental health. It's very, very rough out there for farmers. Um, we've experienced some of our members who are going, excuse me, going through a really hard time. Um, with mental health. So I would um, just recommend that you take action um, as it relates to, to providing additional resources um, and additional staff, um, you know, where it needs to be um, for mental health issues. Um, other than that, I can't necessarily think of, of anything else, although I really do appreciate the open-ended opportunity. Um, add any suggestions, Mr. Chair. Very good. Ms. Maher, any comments you would have? And uh... Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate the opportunity. Um, I, I would echo a lot of what Shar had mentioned in that, you know, farmers in rural Minnesota now have an additional two options available to them. And, you know, as we've seen for, from our co-op members who have elected to offer this to their members, they're hearing it every day when their farmers come into the co-op or they have those conversations. And certainly our employees hear that as well, those who work directly with our members and the farmers, our dairy producers, hear how difficult it can be to afford health care. And some of them have gone without, which can be really scary proposition for people because you never know what might be around the corner and that's the purpose of having insurance is to help you in the event there's something catastrophic. So um, by having the state specific statute as you've heard has provided a great opportunity for Land O'Lakes and for our members to have additional options available to them. Um, I would also echo what Char said in regard to mental health. It's something that we're very aware of as a cooperative. It's very difficult for those in rural America to have access to the mental health resources that are needed. Those of us who are in the city kind of take for granted all that we have access to, and many of those across the state who are in rural communities don't have access to that, and that's not just limited to Minnesota. Mm -hmm. It's across the whole country. And as a cooperative, you know, we're looking for solutions for what we can offer. Land O'Lakes does offer um, an EAP program, an employee assistance program, to our dairy producers, and we've had that in place since 2008. Available a phone number, you know, 24 hours a day for our members to call into for any mental health needs that they may have. Um, last week I was part of a conversation with NAMI. I don't know if you're familiar mm -hmm. with them, um, but hearing today that you know there's this additional uh, movement here in the state to provide more resources out into the rural community for mental health resources is really refreshing and certainly something that's needed. Um, and as far as you know, really anything that we've learned or any improvements, I can tell you now that we have been moving into additional states. Minnesota was one of the easier ones to put this type of plan into. Other states have a lot of additional requirements, um, a lot of legwork that we need to, to do in order to get approved there. So we appreciate how, um, although very buttoned up, Minnesota is, it was a lot easier to put a plan in here than it will be for us to expand into additional states. And appreciate the open-ended question and would welcome an opportunity if it presents itself to be at a table if there's consideration for any additional legislation or changes to the statute that has enabled us to have the plan that we have today. Very good. Certainly an, an open-ended invitation from us to uh, always seek any input if there's things we can do to help. Senator Dietzik has a question. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate all of you testifying very honestly, and I know it is um, challenging out there. There was a story in the paper, I think this weekend, on, um, and I think of Land O'Lakes, I think of dairy, and it was on several dairy farms where the barns have collapsed. And so are you hearing, is that adding to the mental health strain? 
that you're seeing, or is it still just too new that they're literally dealing with what to do with the cows and so haven't reached out to you all yet? Um, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, thank you for the question. Go ahead. Um, I, I'll be honest, that's a little bit outside my wheelhouse as far as answering a question of that nature. I can certainly take it back to our government relations team. Um, from my standpoint, I have not heard anything directly. I know that overall mental health um, and the state of agriculture as it is today has just been a strain overall. And you know the collapsing that you mentioned would just be an additional strain. I have not heard anything directly, but I would be happy to have um, someone from our government relations team circle back in regard to those specific instances. Very good. Ms. Vries, any comment? Or? Oh, yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, um, Senator Zizek. Um, we, we have also not heard of anything specific, but as Emily pointed out, you know, there is already tremendous strain um, there. And uh, um, speaking from personal experience, um, my father-in-law uh, recently exited um, dairying uh, this past fall and um, also received um, a tremendous amount of snowfall where his barn collapsed, which, which he was already in a dire situation and just makes selling his dairy um, even worse. Um, and he, you know, recognizes that that is extremely difficult. Um, but so, no, Senator, we have not heard of any specific um, um, instances but um, just with your previous um, testifier, I did write down um, from, um, he did offer that, um, I can't re exactly remember his name. He was testifying with you. Keith yes, Keith Olander, thank you. Um, he did state that 20 dairy farms across the state were lost um, in the last week, and that's extremely striking um, and concerning. Senator Dietzik, uh, thanks for the question. I'll, uh, you have a follow-up? Thank you, Mr. Chair. You maybe were going to address it. Um, I believe that the commissioner will be maybe having a meeting later this week, and you might be involved in that. I, I um, was going, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I was going I, there. <laughs> yeah, part of my question is, I mean, this is to me is no different than a tornado, in which case we might have a, um, you know, either a federal or state emergency declaration, but, you know, that tornadoes take down barns and houses, and this is the same, so I'm wondering if that is part of the discussion. And Senator Dietzik, uh, we do have some information. Commissioner Tom Peterson, the Department of Ag, uh, I understand is going to have a, a discussion or a meeting on that exact topic. Uh, barn collapses um, this Wednesday at noon. It was scheduled in the Capitol at three, in room 317, but at my understanding is that Kyle just told tells me he's going to have a notice coming out of the change but it's going to be over here in MSB 2308 on uh, Wednesday which will make it even more convenient for several of us uh, but put that on your calendars if your LAs don't but they'll, they'll if they don't have it already but Kyle will send out that modification or update so thanks for bringing that up uh, Senator Goggin has another question well actually it's a comment uh, in regards to Senator Dietzik's uh, question. Uh, I spent Saturday down in Winona County with the commissioner yes. and uh, those farmers are in dire straits. They're hurting. Um, you know, we had talked to one uh, father and son farmers at, uh, in Olmstead County that were there. Uh, they lost their entire operation and uh, so they've uh, had to get rid of the cows and, and uh, everything else and unfortunately their insurance the way it works that they were telling me is it's based on uh, replacement value of when you built the built the barn or the structure. So if you built it in '72 for eighty-five thousand, that's what you're insured to. Uh, most of these barns are two fifty to two fifty and up from what they were saying. Uh, but I do want to commend all of our farmers in southeastern Minnesota. Uh, they banded together. They saved a tremendous number of cows. I was actually surprised to hear that there weren't as many cows lost uh, that uh, you know one farm lost about 13 another lost eight um, but the, all the farmers in the area and the communities came together uh, and did what Minnesota does best and that's help each other out and uh, so they were able to save the cows uh, and help these farmers out with food clothing you name it they were 
you know, people were there to help them out. And, um, you know, it, it's, a, it's a sad situation. As you said, we do need to, uh, we are working on the declar declaration for disaster. And it is the same. It's tornado, wind, whatever you want to call it, flooding. Uh, this is a natural disaster that needs to be uh, addressed. And we need to help these folks with gap financing. Uh, that's the big thing is to help them get through the short term while we're getting insurance and everything else uh, scored away for them. But uh, a pretty sobering uh, day on Saturday. Uh, but I'll tell you what, those folks are uh, resilient and they're, uh, they're, they're determined to, to keep their operations going to whatever they can do. So, uh, but hats off to everybody for uh, coming together to help out their neighbors and their family and their friends. And uh, uh, I look forward to seeing whatever we can do to help them out. Very good. Thank you, Senator Goggin. Uh, any last questions, members? Otherwise, uh, we're about ready to conclude this. So, no further uh, comments or questions. Uh, 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 Emily and Shar and uh, Patrick uh, with the Cooperative Network, uh, I want to thank you for uh, coming in and uh, giving us an oversight of uh, how this law changed has actually been a positive impact. Uh, not everything is always positive. I think this is a very positive story and uh, great to hear what additional offers are out there or options are out there for those that uh, can find a health care option uh, through one of your co-op networks, especially if they're in an area where it's, there's very little or, or nothing uh, else being offered in the marketplace, as well as uh, your creative uh, and willingness to uh, step forward and help fill that need that many of us know our farmers and uh, our dist constituents have had. So uh, uh, this is a great opportunity to see what uh, two years ago uh, legislation that was just words on a, on a paper have turned into for, for farmers and for ag business across our state. And we hope uh, we can be helpful and partners with you on anything that would be helpful to expand that option or make it easier or uh, more available to uh, more families that need it. And so uh, uh, thank you for uh, taking the time to come and share with us on that. And when our uh, door is open for uh, any suggestions in the future, if, if you have them uh, relating to this or other topics. And uh, members, uh, thanks for good work today on the mental health, a very important issue for agriculture and uh, the health care uh, that we just heard about. And uh, thanks for your indulgence and good questions and comments. Uh, with that, no further ado, no further business. The meeting is adjourned.